greetings. My name is Father Douglas Bass, and you are listening to the Inner Kingdom podcast, where we discuss some of the mystical and esoteric aspects of Christianity. Today's topic is the mystery of the virgin birth of Jesus, a doctrine or teaching of the church that often proves to be a dividing line, not only between Christians and non-Christians, but also within Christianity itself. Beginning in the later 19th century and culminating in the early 20th, the so-called modernist movement divided the church itself into modernist and fundamentalist camps. Risking oversimplification, we could say that the modernists held that nothing in the Christian tradition or doctrine was to be accepted as being literally or physically true and therefore worthy of belief, unless it was in line with, or not in contradiction to, the findings of science. So, since it is biologically impossible for a human being to be born without the material substance of male sperm and DNA, it is held by the modernists that it is not possible that the historical Jesus was born by the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost as the Church teaches. Since this program intends to illuminate the esoteric and mystical understandings of Christianity, I should begin by noting that there are many explanations or theories regarding the mystery of the virgin birth, which are generally described as being esoteric. These involve discussions of the interplay of spirit and material substance, or male and female principles, and so forth. They are essentially explorations of the cosmic or pleromic dimensions of the virgin birth mystery, illustrating the fundamental esoteric teaching referred to as the as above, so below principle, the harmony and interconnectedness of the microcosm, the individual, with the macrocosm, or the whole, or the pleroma, or the fullness. Today, however, I would like to discuss the virgin birth mystery from the standpoint of the supposedly mundane level of historicity. I say supposedly because it is commonly held by many Christians, be they modernist or esoteric, as well as other aspirants on the path of spirituality that the realm of physical or historical reality is of a secondary and sometimes even inconsequential nature, and therefore either irrelevant to or even harmful of the spiritual path. However, the path of Christian esotericism is a Catholic path, which is to say a universalizing journey, in which harmony and holism are ever-present guiding spirits. Thus, for something to be true at the macrocosmic or spiritual level, it must also be true, or at least be capable of being true, at the microcosmic level, and importantly, vice versa. To better understand this, let us hear the common refrain of the typical esoteric Christian who speaks glowingly of the miraculous birth of Christ as being a symbol for the very real birth of the so-called Christ within, the awakened human consciousness. This is all well and good. However, according to the overall project of harmonization between the inner and outer, the micro and macro cosmic, If it is held that no virgin birth can occur in the material or physical realm, then it is very questionable, and certainly just as scientifically unverifiable, that the birth of an inner Christ within an awakened individual is a real possibility. Another way we could put this is, there is no inner magic without outer magic, nor outer magic without the inner transmutation that is the key to the esoteric Christian project. So let us now look at the historical issues and concepts that have created the modernist crisis of doubt 
surrounding the virgin birth. Perhaps the best place to start is with the work of biblical scholars, most of whom long ago abandoned the historicity of the virgin birth. According to these scholars, the virgin birth narratives in the Gospels of Matthew, and especially Luke, are later secondary additions to earlier traditions surrounding Jesus. Scholars base their position primarily on two factors. One, whereas Matthew and Luke each include different data in their virgin birth narratives, the Gospels of Mark and John do not reference the virgin birth of Jesus at all, which leads scholars to ask, would such a fantastic and amazing detail about the life of Jesus be left out if the authors of Mark and John knew of such a tradition? Related to this factor is the assumption by scholars that Mark's gospel was written at an earlier date than either Matthew or Luke. The puzzle of the absence of the virgin birth of Jesus in Mark is no mystery to modern biblical scholars. Mark did not include it because the tradition was not known to him. Before moving on to my next point, I must note, as someone who explored quite a bit of advanced biblical scholarship while I attended the Claremont School of Theology, I took enough courses in biblical studies to get my master's in the field, by the way, but I chose instead to get my degree in theological studies. Anyway, I noticed that much modern biblical scholarship involves very circular thinking. So it should be pointed out that one of the primary reasons that Mark's gospel is held to be earlier than that of Matthew or Luke is, you might have guessed it, because it does not include the virgin birth material. Thus scholars assume that this material is secondary and then date the gospels according to this assumption. Then they use the fact that Mark's gospel does not include the material to prove the tradition is late. <laughs> a more convincing scholarly argument against the historicity of the virgin birth narrative is that St. Paul, whose epistles are held to have been written before any of the gospels had been composed, makes no mention of the virgin birth. As a matter of fact, as many esotericists know, St. Paul makes little mention of any of the biographical data surrounding the life of Jesus as it is presented in the canonical Gospels. This is especially problematic for the historicity of the virgin birth tradition because St. Paul, at several points in his letters, argues for the divinity of Christ. And what better argument could be marshaled for the defense of the divinity of Christ than the virgin birth? The fact that St. Paul does not refer to the tradition of the virgin birth is thought to be telling in this regard. Now the absence of the virgin birth in the Gospels of Mark and John, and especially in St. Paul's epistles, are compelling evidence for doubting the historicity of the virgin birth of Jesus. But only, I contend, because we, that is, Christians in general, and even esoteric Christians, have lost touch with the earliest understandings of the first followers of Jesus and their direct descendants in the apostolic age. We have lost touch with what I refer to as the keys of Gnosis, the apostolic tradition, which was not nearly as dogmatic or draconian or miserable as we modern seekers imagine it to have been. For this tradition was, in fact, quite mystical, and yes, even Gnostic. This Gnostic tradition within early Christianity has become quite a stumbling block for us, and really for nearly the whole history of the Christian Church, since the dualistic distortions of some of the 1st through the 4th century heretical Gnostics essentially tarnished some of the most basic doctrines of the early Christians. One of these tarnished aspects of the Christian tradition was that of secrecy or esotericism. The heretical or dualistic Gnostics 
maintained that there were secret doctrines regarding the nature of God, and especially surrounding the creation of the world, that could only be divulged to an elite inner circle of Christians. The real problem with the secrecy of these Gnostics was not the concept of secrecy or esotericism itself, but rather the content of their esotericism, which involved a secret counter-history of God and God's creation. For these heretics, the word heresy, meaning making a choice, that is, a wrong choice based on misunderstanding, the secret was that the God who created the world and human beings was not the real God but rather either an ignorant fool or a malevolent dictator of a divine being who had usurped the power and identity of the real yet unknown God. This conceptualization of the Christian secret was a misunderstanding of the apostolic Gnostic secret teaching which dealt with the nature of Satan and the fallen angels and their influence over the created world, including human beings. This conceptualization of the Christian secret was a misunderstanding of the apostolic Gnostic secret teaching, which dealt with the nature of Satan and the fallen angels and their influence over the created world, including human beings. This secret teaching regarding Satan deserves its own separate podcast, really several podcasts, so we won't dwell on it in this talk. However, it should be kept in mind that it is this secret teaching regarding Satan and his influence with humanity that lies at the heart of the esotericism of the apostolic tradition and the praxis, that is, the practice of the early church. Now this may surprise some listeners, that is, my contention that secrecy was a dominant theme within the doctrine and teaching of the early church. This is because not many people, outside of a few church historians and patrologists who specialize in the early centuries of Christianity, are aware of the phenomena within the early church known as the discipline arcane, or secret discipline. This involved the practice, within the early church, of withholding certain teachings from Christians until after they were catechized by the church, only to be divulged to those who were prepared to be baptized and chrismated. Although scholars have long argued as to what specifically the content of this secret teaching involved, it is now commonly understood that the arcane discipline involved the doctrines found, for the most part, in the earliest Christian creeds, that is, such subjects as the virgin birth of Jesus, his resurrection, descent into the underworld, and ascension into heaven. So why were these subjects, or historical factoids, if you will, which are now so commonly known throughout the world, even to those outside of the Christian religion. Why were these considered worthy of a veil of secrecy? Because for the early Christians, the knowledge of the facts surrounding the life of Christ held great power. Power to succeed in the principal struggle that lay at the heart of the spiritual life in early Christianity to attain victory against Satan and his minions. As late as the middle of the fourth century, St. Ambrose wrote concerning the Apostles' Creed, The twelve apostles, as skillful artificers, assembled together and made a key by their common advice, that is, the creed, by which the darkness of the devil is disclosed, that the light of Christ may appear. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem, in his catechal lectures, would not even recite the words of the creed in front of the gathered uh, catechumens that were before him, lest the stenographer write them down. In other words, 
the creed, the life and actions of Jesus contained in the creed, were considered to be a powerful weapon against Satan, against the darkness. With this in mind, let us return to the absence of the virgin birth in the Gospel of Mark and John. If there was in arcane discipline a secret teaching within the church surrounding the life of Jesus, then it could be that, perhaps, the birth of Jesus, of a virgin, could be part of such a secret instruction, perhaps even one of the most secret parts. Perhaps the best way to approach this hypothesis is to look into the history of heresy within the early church. We know that there were two primary heresies with which the church struggled at the beginning of its existence. One was that of the so-called Jewish Christians, or the Ebionites. These Christians typically viewed Jesus as either A, an angel disguised as a man, or B, a man whose complete and total obedience to God qualified him to be considered the greatest last prophet. For some Jewish Christians, these two Christologies were combined into a third option, that Jesus was a pious and holy man who was overshadowed by an angelic last prophet figure when Jesus was baptized. What is interesting to note for now is that there were Jewish Christians who viewed Jesus as a being greater than human who was disguised as the man Jesus. The other earliest Christian heretics were the aforementioned Gnostics. These taught that Jesus was either A, a man who was specially chosen by the unknown God to become enlightened in order to reveal the unknown God to humanity, or B, a divine messenger from the unknown God who descended to earth and appeared to be human in the image of Jesus. Similar to some of the Jewish Christians, some of the Gnostics also held a fusion of these two positions, teaching that Jesus was a man who was, at his baptism, overshadowed or possessed by the emissary from the unknown God. Again, Note this theme of Jesus being a disguised, otherworldly being who only appears to be a human. If we inquire as to what the Jewish and Gnostic Christians have in common, we see that first, as already mentioned, there is this element of disguise in regard to Jesus' humanity, especially for the Gnostics. More importantly, though, we notice that both groups share an inability to understand or accept the teaching of the Christians on the Incarnation, the Incarnation of the Divine in a human being. For both the Jewish Christian and the Gnostic, there is a fundamental divide between the physical, the human, and the spiritual, the divine. At the risk of putting things perhaps too crudely or simplistically, we can say that for the Ebionites, Jesus could not have been divine, and for the Gnostics, Jesus could not have been human. Excluding, of course, those Ebionites for whom Jesus could have been angelic but not divine, and those Gnostics who did think Jesus was a human being but had been possessed or overtaken by the Spirit of the Christ from the point of his baptism to his crucifixion. And here we come to the fundamental point of the virgin birth, which is to say, it is a seemingly necessary corollary to the doctrine or tradition of the pre-existence of Christ and Jesus as the God-man, the Son of God incarnated as a human being. However, the biblical scholars and many modernists and esoteric Christians posit that this doctrine, that is, of the Incarnation, is not a part of the earliest tradition. So we seem to have circled back to the beginning, as it were. So where then does this tradition of the virgin birth come from? Is it, as the modernists, the skeptics, and the scholars say, 
derived from the need of the so-called proto-Catholics to turn the prophet and reformer, but very human Jesus, into a divine being, and therefore is it a secondary accretion to the tradition? One of the things you will discover if you listen to future episodes of this podcast is that I like to challenge my audience by positing ideas and concepts that they are not likely to encounter in typical metaphysical or esoteric communities or commentaries. This is because I have found that the purest and surest way to engage upon the esoteric Christian path is to refrain from rejecting the Christian past, rejecting the tradition out of hand, and rather to dive more deeply into it in order to discover which aspects of this tradition have been forgotten, abandoned, even jettisoned. So let us try this and let's see what happens. As hinted at a minute or so ago, many scholars and historians of early Christianity have posited that there was an original, basically Jewish Christianity, with some elements that would later develop into other groups of Christians, that is, Gnostics and the so-called Proto-Orthodox. It is said that the Proto-Orthodox party essentially forced its way into positions of power, and then crafted what would eventually, over the course of a few centuries, become the Catholic or Orthodox Church. Identifiable by its creeds, dogmas, and the authority structure of bishops and priests. In this process, the Jewish Christians and the Gnostic Christians were forced out, declared to be heretics, and on and on. However, as I also stated a few minutes ago, the early church also had a secret teaching, which was formulated in the creeds, and which was, in, and this is important, an oral tradition, that is, not written down. Hence, St. Cyril not wanting to even recite the creed among a group of catechumens for fear that it would be written down. Now we do know that many of the biographical details which comprise the creeds, the virgin birth, resurrection, and so on, were discussed in the writings of early proto-Orthodox Christians. But what was the context of these writings and the revealing of such matters that I am claiming were secret or esoteric in nature? And here we come upon something very interesting. These writings were largely apologetic and heresiological. That is, they deal with the heresies. In other words, the reason that these once esoteric doctrines, such as the virgin birth, were being discussed publicly in some quarters of Christianity was because the writers felt that they had been forced to do so by the writings of the Jewish and Gnostic Christians. When St. Arianaeus writes his refutation of all heresies in the middle of the second century, it is because the writings of the heretical Gnostics have already spread among the people. When St. Clement of Alexandria writes his Stromata with the purpose of unveiling some of the esoteric Christian understandings, it is in order to refute the writings of the Gnostic dualists. Origins on first principles is likewise motivated by a need to set the record straight, so to speak. Now let us return to the absence of the virgin birth in Mark's Gospel. This Gospel very well may be earlier than Matthew and Luke, but if the virgin birth is a mystery, Perhaps it is not a case of Mark not knowing of such a tradition, but rather of Matthew and Luke deciding to reveal the tradition. Is there any internal evidence of this? If we look at Mark, we notice what scholars have referred to as Mark's overall theme, which is called the Messianic Secret. This refers to Mark's consistent portrayal of Jesus performing healings and exorcisms, and then warning the beneficiaries of these 
as well as the demons who are said to have caused the problems, not to reveal the divine identity of Jesus until it is the appropriate time to do so. And what is the appropriate time to reveal the identity of Jesus as the divine Son of God? St. Paul, and remember that his epistles are said to be the oldest Christian writings, points the way here when he states that the powers and principalities, that is, the demonic powers that attempt to keep God and humanity in a state of disharmony, According to St. Paul, these powers would not have crucified Jesus if they would have known who he was. So the secret identity of Jesus is found explicitly in Mark and in St. Paul, is a foundational understanding in the earliest strata of Christianity. And this secret identity is related to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. This, of course, is related to the centrality of the meaning of the cross in early Christianity. Now let us look at the Gospel of Luke. Of all the verses found in the New Testament, perhaps none has been so easily overlooked as the opening of this Gospel. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, it seemed good to me also, having diligently attained to all things from the beginning, to write to thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mayest know the verity of those words in which thou hast been instructed. Notice first that the addressee is a Christian who has already been instructed about the Christian faith. This is the oral teaching, the arcane secret, the creedal instruction regarding the life of Christ. However, as Luke's Gospel says, many have taken in hand to set forth in order a narrative, that is, Many Gospels have already been written, and the author of Luke obviously, and here is where the Church, and Biblical scholars, and even esoteric Christians have really missed the boat. The author of Luke clearly intends his narratives to be a correction or clarification of some things. For there must be some discontinuity between the teaching that Theophilus has been instructed in and the many ordered accounts of the life of Jesus, that is, Gospels. And what does the author first proceed to do in Luke's Gospel? To narrate the prophetic and miraculous births of John the Baptist and Jesus. Why does Luke do this? Is it simply to tell a fanciful tale? Is it to make sure that the new dogma of the incarnate Son of God replaces the older understandings of the person of Jesus? Or could it, perhaps, be another version of the virgin birth tradition was circulating among early Christians? There is evidence within apocryphal writings for just such a possibility. A text known as the Ascension of Isaiah, which scholars generally date from 90 to 150 AD, includes what appears at first glance to be a borrowing from the canonical virgin birth narratives. In this version, though, there are two peculiar differences. In the Ascension of Isaiah, the Son, or Christ, is told by the Father to descend through the heavens, which are layered, disguising himself to have the appearance of whichever angel is ruling a particular heaven, giving the ruling angel in each heaven a password that allows him to pass through the heavens without suspicion. Then it is the Christ himself, disguised as the angel Gabriel, who makes the Annunciation to Mary. After about five months of appearing to be in Mary's womb, Jesus suddenly appears before her and Joseph as a baby, and Mary now appears as though she had never been pregnant. 
Jesus then informs the amazed couple that they must pretend to treat him as a normal child, even breastfeeding him, so that no one will find out that he is a divine incarnation. This text is clearly docetic, and docetism being the heresy that Christ only appeared to have a human body. However, it also reveals a similarity to the apostolic Gnostic teaching found in the Gospel of Mark and in St. Paul that Jesus had to conceal his divine identity. What ultimately pushes the ascension of Isaiah into the realm of heresy is not so much its docetism, but its thorough denigration of the angels, which the text says have usurped the power of God, claiming that, quote, we alone are and there is no other. This was a corruption of a classic Gnostic proof text taken from the mouth of the God of Israel, whose claim that he was the only God was said by the Gnostics to prove not only his arrogance, but also the existence of a superior unknown God, that God made known to the Gnostics only. However, the tradition of the secret descent of the Savior, embedded within the text of the Ascension of Isaiah, is probably older than the corrupted Gnostic proof text, or the motive of the hostility of the angels towards humanity. Another apocryphal text, probably from the late 2nd or early 3rd century, known as the Apostolic Epistle, was intended to refute such Gnostic dualism and denigration of the Creator God and His creation. This text mimics the Gnostic Revelation dialogue, in which the Christ instructs and teaches assorted apostles Gnostic mysteries after His resurrection. What is curious, however, is that even though the text is an orthodox refutation of heretical Gnosticism, it includes the secret descent of Jesus through the heavens, with Jesus once again disguising himself as the angel in each particular heaven. The difference is that there is no specific denigration of the angels or even a reason given for why Jesus would have to secretly descend through the heavens in the first place. Nonetheless, the inclusion of the secret descent in this text which is an anti-Gnostic apocryphal writing, gives us an important clue as to the degree to which the secret descent tradition was accepted in the early church. As noted already, this secret descent motive is no doubt connected to the apostolic Gnostic tradition of the secret identity of Jesus as a necessary prerequisite for the mission Jesus was to accomplish on the cross. But where did it come from? Why was it included in the virgin birth narrative? It seems to me that the virgin birth narrative was derived largely from circles of Gnostic Christians who had been drawn into the orbit of the proto-Catholic Church. These Gnostics' belief in the pre-existence of Christ no doubt caused them a problem when proselytizing for the more Jewish Christian tradition, which was probably older and was also part of the proto-Catholic party beliefs, included Jesus' brother, James, the leader of the Jerusalem church in the immediate aftermath of the crucifixion, and of course, Mary and Joseph, that is, the parents of Jesus. How were the Gnostics to maintain that Jesus was both pre-existent and born of Mary. According to their theology, physical matter was unable to have converse with spirit or the divine. The solution was that Jesus was in fact born, but not in the usual human manner, but rather by a divine intervention, and that his body was therefore somehow different than human. Now this, of course, is not orthodox or Catholic teaching on the subject as it has been propounded for the past millennium or more. However, there is no way around it. The virgin birth narrative 
clearly exhibits a heretical Gnostic origin. Four, if Christ in the person of Jesus became man so that man could become as God, if Jesus Christ was truly a man in order to bring salvation to humankind, then why was it necessary for him to be born in such a non-human manner? That is, why couldn't he have had a human father? I believe that the answer is that the virgin birth narrative is the best solution that the apostolic tradition could bring forward to present how Jesus could have been both human and divine. For there was clearly a belief in the earliest Christian communities that there was too much of a disconnect, too much animosity between spirit and flesh to allow for the divinely incarnated Son of God to be born by normative human means, that is, by sex. Likewise, the other Christian solutions to the problem, the Ebionite, the Jewish Christians, and the Gnostic, were insufficient to explain the mystery that was taught in the divine incarnation. The Ebionite contention that Jesus was a prophet downplayed his divinity, and their alternative theory that Jesus was an angel downplayed both his divinity and his humanity. The heretical Gnostic contention that Jesus was a kind of spiritual envoy of the unknown God, disguised as a human being, likewise downplayed his humanity, just as their alternative solution that he was a human being who had been possessed by the unknown God for a short while in order to accomplish his mission downplayed his divinity. So, the proto-Catholic party very well may have adopted an early Gnostic tradition regarding the birth of Jesus, which was probably intended to explain how Jesus, though divine, could have been born to a human mother and father, and been raised as a child until adulthood, without anyone knowing about it. It was, said the Gnostics, all a ruse, so that Jesus could accomplish his mission on the cross without interference of Satan and his minions. This story was adopted by the likes of the authors of Matthew and Luke, who removed the ruse aspect of it, since by the late or early 2nd century there were probably proto-Catholics who were leery of the implications of God essentially tricking Satan into crucifying his son. Just as Matthew and Luke removed the degree of secrecy found in Mark's Gospel. Nonetheless, Matthew's Gospel retains some of the ominous nature of the secret identity of Jesus related to his birth. This is found in the account of the so-called Holy Innocents whereby the infant Jesus' parents must flee with him to Egypt in order to avoid Herod's dragnet of slaughter. We will probably never know if the Ebionite contention that Jesus was born according to normative human processes was older than the tradition of the virgin birth. However, even early Jewish Christian Apocrypha leave a strong possibility that the doctrine was especially held in secret by the early Christians. The most complete exposition of the Ebionite doctrines is given in a 3rd century text known as the Clementine Homilies. What is curious about these texts in relation to our subject is that although the Clementines clearly contain older traditions, they were nonetheless compiled in their final form no earlier than the 3rd century. Now by the 3rd century, the teachings of the Catholic and Orthodox churches regarding Mary and Jesus' virgin birth were quite widely known. So why do the Clementines make no mention of this, nor even of Jesus' mother, if for no other reason than to disprove such contentions? I suspect that the reason is 
that even among the Jewish Christians, it was taught orally that Jesus was born of Mary and that this was a miraculous birth. The Ebionites, who had preserved the traditions found in the Clementines, had kept this emphasis on oral secrecy even into the third century. The virgin birth very well could have been part of their esoteric deposit of faith. In conclusion, we could also speculate that the virgin birth tradition may not have been part of the original deposit of the arcane mysteries of Christianity, at least not as it is expressed in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. As Christianity is, when it is true to itself, a Catholic, universalizing faith, a harmonizing synthesis of supposed opposites, the canonical accounts of the virgin birth could have been derived from the proto-Catholic desire to provide a bridge by which different groups of Christians, be they Ebionites, Gnostics, or proto-Catholics, could be drawn into the wider Catholic vision. In this sense, the virgin birth may have originally been a profound mystery, which had not been articulated or expounded upon in a particular way, until such time as the interpretive data of the Jewish and Gnostic Christians was found to be suitable for constructing a narrative that could most closely approximate the mystery. As the canonical Gospels themselves state, the Spirit will lead you into all truth. And perhaps it was the Spirit who led the Church into the understanding of the mystery of the virgin birth, and thereby, through a process of vision, was able to view the truth of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. This is Father Douglas Best. Until the next time we come together in spirit and mind, let us seek the truth of God in all honesty and sincerity. Let us tread the pathways of God in peace and loving service to one another. And let us dwell in the presence of the inner kingdom. Amen.